Good evening. I'm Tony Jones. Welcome to Q&A. Here to answer your questions tonight, Anglican rector and theologian Michael Jensen. Embattled Labor Senator Sam Dastiari. <laughs> ANU law professor and citizenship expert Kim Rubenstein. Feminist author, presenter and columnist Jamila Rizvi. And Tasmanian Senator and former Abbott Cabinet Minister Erica Betts. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, Q&A is live across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Standard Time. You can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Our first question comes from Nick Scarcella. Now, Barnaby Joyce has been found to have New Zealand citizenship. Surely in 2017 there would be background checks performed from ASIO or another federal security department to prevent this from happening in the first place and all dual citizen aspiring politicians would be notified before they were even considered to run for election. Kim Rubenstein, this sounds so simple. Can it work? And if so, why has it been implemented already? Off you go, Kim. Thank you very much, Mick. Well, it's certainly been a very busy time for someone who's an expert in citizenship law. Our parliament has provided many opportunities to think about this, and it's not the first time that we're thinking about these questions. There have been earlier High Court cases. So, Mick, your question is a fair one. Why weren't those individuals thinking about these things before they nominated to become a Member of Parliament? So the Electoral Commission does ask individuals if they are a, mem if they are a citizen of another country. But the key issue is that the question of whether you're a, cit a citizen of another country depends on another country's laws. And so for some people, the complications associated with determining whether you're a citizen of another country mean that we've got ourselves into this situation. But there are three core ways that you can become a citizen. By birth in another country, by virtue of being a descendant, either a child or even a grandchild of someone who is a citizen of another country, or if you've lived in a country for a sufficient period of time and have applied for citizenship. But those first two, we have no choice where we're born or where our parents were born. Well, this is, uh, I'll just bring you to the point, in a sense, for Barnaby Joyce's father was a New Zealander. Yes. Um, as we now understand, that makes Barnaby Joyce a New Zealander, according to the New Zealand <laughs> government. Does that mean constitutionally he should be barred from Parliament? Well, constitutionally, it's very clear that if you are a citizen of another country, then you are not eligible to nominate to become a Member of Parliament. So there is, an, in some ways, a black and white answer here that he is disqualified from becoming a Member of Parliament. So is he, is he breaking the law by being there and by voting and possibly uh, by being in Cabinet, making decisions in Cabinet, maybe even becoming the Acting Prime Minister? There is a really interesting distinction between this notion of breaking the law and acting unlawfully. A distinction which is, in terms of <coughs> knowledge of that unlawful reality, as opposed to acting intentionally. So this is something that I think will be interesting for the High Court to um, determine what was reasonable on behalf of these individuals who are saying that they didn't know that they were citizens of another country. Because the High Court position at the moment is that a person has to do all that is reasonable on their part to divest themselves of that other citizenship. Now, if you don't know about that other citizenship, what is reasonable? But I think it begs the question, how reasonable is it for someone who either was born in another country or who has a parent or grandparent from another country not to have at least inquired and followed that up? OK, we know the High Court very briefly and then we'll go on to the other panellists, but we need to hear some of these things from the expert <coughs> first. So we know the High Court is due in a couple of weeks to make a directional hearing. Um, how long could it take for them to actually make a decision on the Barnaby Joyce case? Well, how long is a piece of string in the sense that the court has to properly consider the arguments that are put before it and make a decision, but it would obviously see the urgency of these sorts of matters. And, as I said, it's not as if these issues have not been thought about. There, are pre there is a precedent in the Sykes and Cleary case and in the Heather Hill case for the court to build on its interpretation of that section. But in the meantime, if Barnaby Joyce stays there, he's acting unlawfully, is that what you're saying? Well, something is only unlawful at the point that the court determines that is the case. Ah, all right. Erica Betts, um, have you got a little loophole there where you can keep the Deputy Prime Minister in place? <laughs> um, well, I think there's a significant difference. If you were born overseas, like Sam and I were, you are on notice that you've got to ensure that you do not happen to be a dual citizen. And uh, might I just quickly add, in my own circumstance, uh, 
1974, when I became an Australian citizen, I had to officially, publicly renounce all former allegiances, and in doing so, the country of my birth uh, reciprocated by renouncing me, because that was the law of uh, the country uh, at that time. So I think being born overseas puts you on notice. Um, it, it would be a bizarre thing, Kim, if the High Court were to say, because of a unilateral law, let's say Iraq, were to, or sorry, Iran, were to determine that Sam were a citizen unilaterally, that should not disqualify Sam. You're not comparing New Zealand with parliament. Iran now, are you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think that is where there is a significant material difference, and uh, I'll be very interested to see how the High Court deals with that. But uh, if you have an antecedent of a father being born in New Zealand, why on earth would you be on notice unless you were a student of New Zealand citizenship law that you were a New Zealand citizen? So, so, uh, so I think there's a very good argument. All right, very briefly, that. the government seems to be struggling to explain what's different about the Matt Canavan case because he's also in the National Party, was in Cabinet, he's stepped out of Cabinet now because he doesn't think it's right to be in Cabinet. Why should Barnaby Joyce be in Cabinet? I think there's a significant difference where, in Matt Canavan's position, his mother, if we are to believe the news stories, took a proactive action. If you are to believe Matt Canavan. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> a, a proactive... <coughs> sorry, I'm not sure what I said, but if you were to believe that which is out there in the media, Matt Canavan's mother took a proactive action to make him a citizen of Italy, and I think that is different to somebody not knowing at all. But is it really for you to determine? Isn't this question a question for the court to determine? Oh, of course it is. You know, wh where is. you've got Malcolm Turnbull up in question time today saying, and the High Court will so find, you know, like, separation of powers doesn't really matter that much. I mean, I, I feel like the sensible thing to do and the right thing to do is for Mr Joyce to say, I will wait and I will step aside, I will move out of the Cabinet until this is resolved. I hope it's resolved very swiftly and I'll come back and be, you know... Take the tip. The High Court will not be influenced by any pronoun uh, uh, pronouncement by the Prime Minister, myself, or anybody on this so, panel So tonight. was it wise for the Prime Minister to make the case that the High Court will decide I was in favour of... The, the Deputy Prime Minister. I was wending my way here uh, afterwards, uh, after question time, and I'm in the Senate, so I'm not sure what the Prime Minister said. Uh, suffice to say that I'm sure the High Court will make up their own mind. But there is a material difference between Barnaby's position, where no proactive decision was taken, whereas in uh, Matt Canavan's situation, his mother did take a proactive decision. All right, let's decision. see if Labor agrees with that. There's a fundamental difference here. Sam Dastiari. G'day, g'day. Um, look, uh, I don't... No one seems to be able to explain to me properly why there's one set of rules for Matt Canavan and another set of rules for Barnaby Joyce. Frankly, to me, it looks like there's one set of rules because one of them was a Cabinet Minister and one of them is the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, the precedent was set with... And Matt. presumably one of them's in the lower house. One of them's in the lower house, so there could be a by-election. Um, frankly, it just looks like there's two standards here. The government set the precedent by having Matt Canavan step down. Uh, but I have to say, look, I've got a bit of sympathy for Matt, for Barnaby, for everyone who's been caught up in this, because I don't think I think it'd be wrong to question their allegiance to this country because of some provision in the constitution. I think uh, I think some of this is a broader debate we need to have. But uh, but I just can't understand how the government's going to allow this smell of illegitimacy to continue. You've got a Labor MP in Tasmania, Justine Key, who's also under a citizenship cloud. I mean. If both of them end up being ruled out, that brings us back to the status quo in the House of Reps, doesn't it? Look, again, I, I can't speak... When, on the when's that going to be resolved, that one? I can't speak on the specifics of Justine. I know the Labor Party has... But the incredible... National Party ones he can. Right? <laughs> well, look, the, the Labor Party has incredibly stringent processes. I mean, I went through probably one of the most difficult processes imaginable. If you want to know how hard it is to renounce a citizenship, good luck trying to renounce Iranian citizenship, which is the process I went through. I mean, that's a country that doesn't even play by international rules. Um, but what amazes me in all of this, I have to say, is we can have a separate debate about whether this is right or whether it's wrong. The reality is the rules are the rules. And what I find amazing in this is for some of these people, and some of them are friends of mine, I consider Scott Ludlam a good mate of mine, it would take a simple email, uh, filling out a form, paying a small fee, and I had to go through an incredibly difficult 
$25,000 process with lawyers in Iran, lawyers in Australia, forms being filled out, professional translators, these incredibly difficult steps. And you kind of say to yourself, geez, guys, send a bloody email. You know, pay you 200 bucks. Mm. Uh, do, Michael, you want it? Was, is there well, a kind I, of moral uh, position on this? Well, I do think that uh, perhaps now Barnaby Joyce gets to um, support a winning rugby team, so that might be a po po positive for him. Um, I do wish that uh, the, uh, the every parliamentarian could they please just go and check their their, their citizenship? I mean, now could that be done? Because uh, you know this is this is getting a bit ridiculous, uh, and it just as one flows on to the next. I, I think there is a. Uh, uh, an important principle at stake that we, we deserve to have um, people representing us who, are, uh, who have Australian allegiance. And so there's a principle in the Constitution. It's clearly not working under the way international law works at the moment. It's clearly causes confusion. And really, it's up to people like uh, Kim to sort it out for us. Um, yeah, Michael, <laughs> that leads to our next question, so we'll come back to you in a minute. But uh, the next question is from Tom Rumming. With this recent dual citizenship debacle, we had calls for the law to be changed, which would mean changing our constitution. However, doesn't this rule ensure that our representatives have complete devotion to Australia and the Australian people? Kim. Look, I think this is a really fundamental question that we all have to think about in a society like Australia, where I would be very interested in this room. How many of you have a parent who was born in another country? Look okay, at the significant right. number of people. Well, room. I don't know if we saw the wide shot, but virtually the whole audience, really, so, or a very high percentage. So, so if we live in a society that believes that our parliament should represent the people, we're essentially saying that all of us who experience... Well, actually, I'm a sixth-generation Australian, but that, the, <laughs> that there is such a significant number of Australians who effectively are being asked to make a statement that they're only connected to one country in a formal sense. Now, my question to you is, if you take that formal step, how much does it actually change your sense of connection to that other country? Mm. You may still have family in that other country. And isn't it better to have some clarity and transparency about the different things that influence us as individuals when we're making decisions when we're members of parliament? Well, Kim, that's effectively an argument for another referendum. Um, <laughs> well, the I... only way you can change the constitution, isn't it? We need to change the constitution, but everyone laughs. We live in a democracy where we should expect of our leadership some bipartisanship on issues that are so fundamental and reflect current needs in our, in our society. A constitution has to be a living document that reflects the needs of the people. Now, we have changed the constitution. It's not as if we haven't been able to do it at all. Mm. It's just about bipartisanship. And this is something that is quite significant because it does affect all of us. And more importantly, I think, if we look at the way dual citizenship operates in our society, it's changed to be... Um, a, a natural and normal way of thinking about the way we connect as human beings. And can I just make one yeah, further absolutely. point? If you think about citizenship as if it's like marriage, then that's the sole allegiance notion. But if you think about citizenship like parenthood, where you can have more than one child without that undermining your sense of commitment, then we can see and appreciate that dual citizenship is not about undermining an allegiance to Australia. It is about representing the real-life experience of the people who are meant to be represented in Parliament. All right, strong point. Now, Jamila, can you see uh, Kiwi Barnaby Joyce um, leading this referendum campaign, <laughs> change the constitution <laughs> to make him legal? Uh, no, I can't. I think, I, firstly, I feel a little bit like I'm back at law school and I went to Kim's law school and I've got to say, no-one taught us about Section 44. When we were doing law, we did offer and acceptance, we did freedom of political communication. No-one told me this was going to be so important. And I feel like there's a bone to pick with you there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think if we're going to have a genuine debate in this country about whether or not this section should be reformed, then let's have it. But let's have it on the merits of that provision and whether or not that provision should stand and whether or not it is important, rather than us deciding we're going to have the debate because a bunch of our politicians didn't get their stuff together to be able to fill out some forms properly. Well, there's a good point. Eric Abetz, um, should there be uh, a constitutional referendum or should politicians or aspiring politicians just check out where their father was born? I think our founding fathers got it right. If you want the privilege to serve in the Australian Parliament, you should only have a commitment to Australia. 
The idea that you could serve in the Australian Parliament as a dual citizen would, for example, mean you could also technically be elected, we'll use the Italian example, yeah. of serving in the Italian Parliament. Along comes an <laughs> extradition treaty, along comes a free trade agreement, or worst of all, your two countries are at war. To whom are you going to owe your allegiance? To which country are you going to really try to do your very best with the extradition treaty or the free trade agreement? If you want the privilege to serve in the Australian Parliament, I had no difficulty in doing what I had to do uh, to ensure that uh, I could serve in the Australian Parliament. Sam Dastyari, why was this rule brought about in the first place? Why did the, why did the founders put this rule into the Constitution? Well, again, Kim's the expert here, but as I understand it, the founders put this rule in for the simple reason of what Eric said, which is they wanted to make sure that, you know, the British subjects, if you will, were the members of uh, Australian Parliament uh, and that Australians... Uh, because the whole idea of citizenship came in kind of much later than that. And again, Kim's the expert. But what Eric is saying, and where I agree with Eric, is that the idea that you should only be an Australian to sit in the Australian Parliament, I think, is a solid principle that I think would have overwhelming support out there in the community. The problem with Section 44, and again, I'm not a constitutional expert here, we have one beside me, um, I'll comment, but I'm not an expert, uh, is that its interpretation, its reality, what it means is quite unclear, is quite odd. There's this whole questions about people from second generation and other kind of steps and what does it all mean and the practical reality of it. The principle, which Eric is completely right about, Australians in the Australian Parliament, we all agree on. The problem with Section 44 is its practical implication means people like Scott and Larissa and maybe Barnaby and them are out of Parliament. And frankly, I don't question their allegiance to this country at all. So do you think Barnaby just should be allowed to stay in Parliament until this is resolved? No, I think that... Well, look, that's, that's a matter for others. What I do believe... Well, that's a, is, it's a no, matter no, of opinion, no, no. so well, I'm asking your opinion. Well, I think he should step down and follow the example that was set by Canavan uh, and follow the process that was followed by Senator Matt Canavan. Uh, but I do believe, you know, the rules are the rules. And we all had to play by the same set of rules. We're having a separate debate now whether or not we should change the rules, and that's a legitimate debate to have. But when I was running for parliament, when Eric was running for parliament, when Barnaby was running for parliament, we all knew what the rules were. And frankly, I'll tell you what it looks like at the moment. It looks like the major parties in the Labor and the Liberal Party kind of had their act together, and the smaller parties didn't. That's really the reality of, I think, what's happened in a lot of these processes. The, the other point, too, worth adding is, I think anyone kind of running for parliament now is going to check. <laughs> yeah, Michael, um, what do you think? Well, I, 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 it's interesting that the uh, head of state, I'm not sure that she even has Australian <laughs> citizenship, so uh, we could ask about her. <laughs> can yeah. I just make one yeah, well, more can, point can, about... Yes, can I just throw a question to you, because yeah. the uh, front page of the Australian today, another um, constitutional expert is talking about the possibility of proroguing the parliament. Now, we know uh, there are all sorts of problems if Barnaby Joyce has to step down because there's a one-seat majority. Could the parliament be prorogued or suspended until this is resolved? So there is a provision in the Constitution for proroguing Parliament and, of course, it's the Governor-General um, acting on the advice of um, Members of Parliament. So this is a possibility. But I would actually like to say uh, one further point in relation to this the Founding Fathers. And, of course, they were Founding Fathers. There were no women who drafted the Constitution. And at that time, all of the members of the community were British subjects. We didn't have, as Sam just alluded to, Australian citizenship didn't start until 1949. British subjects were British subjects both in Australia and there were British subjects outside of Australia. The concept of British subject status recognised that you could have a connection to more than one country without that undermining your sense of commitment to a country. So this idea of allegiance being exclusive wasn't even around at that time. But it was around because, as you've identified, at that time there was much greater emphasis on countries conscripting individuals to fight in, in wars. Now, those direct conflicts you can provide for, but to have that as your basic common denominator, to me, does not reflect the reality of our democracy. It's going to be a busy time in the High Court in the mm. coming months. Uh, we'll move on because we've got some other issues to deal with. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. And keep an eye on RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. Well, the next question comes from Maya Avramovic. How is dual citizenship a threat to our sovereignty, but donations from foreign billionaires are not? Sam Dastiari. Yeah. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, good to have you back. 
I agree. I think they are. Uh, I think that we should be banning donations from certainly from foreign individuals and you know in recent times I've said that I think we should go further than that and insofar as it's constitutionally possible to do so uh, we should ban all donations. This is as a result of your Definitely, own yeah, problem. Definitely, yeah, of course. So, I of mean, course. Can I just put this to yeah. you in a, in a really straight way? Do you think the Chinese government was trying to duchess you to bring you onto their side as a kind of agent of influence of all no. the money they were throwing your way no. and the Labor Party's way? No, but I believe the donation culture in this country has gotten out of control. I think when you've got that kind of pressure to raise money, when you have the Prime Minister put $1.7 million of his own money into an election campaign, I think we are very fast heading down the American path. And a new congressman or a congresswoman in the US is told this, you spend 80 to 90% of your time raising money. There is an incredible amount of pressure to raise money. Uh, I believe it leads to bad outcomes. Uh, and I believe that now is the time to reform it. There are constitutional challenges with doing that. I believe they can be worked through. Uh, and, you know, you know, if we have to change the question. Sam, I'm going to have to interrupt here because, I mean, you took $5,000 from one Chinese donor to settle a legal bill, $1.5,000, $1.6,000 from yeah. another to pay a travel bill, and then you turn around and come to the decision no, no, that no. all... Yeah, no, 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 no. But, but I am a, that is a product of what I went through. Right? I mean, I'm not pretending to be, you know, I'm not sitting here as some kind of puristy. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here as a realist, right? And what I went through last year, and let's just be very, very, let's, let's go through this very quickly. I had a $1,670 travel over expense uh, that I got a Chinese donor to pay. I declared that on my Pecunia <laughs> register. Um, I should have paid that myself. Uh, and over that, uh, and this whole kind of perception matter, I resigned from the Labor Party front bench. But why, just, uh, why did you do it? Well, according to my best mate who very kindly went on Australian Story and said that I'm a cheapskate, <laughs> uh, um, uh, frankly, to be honest, I think I spent a fair bit of time stepping back and asking myself that question. Um, I didn't really think enough about it. I didn't think enough about the perception of it. I treated it like I would have treated a campaign pool. That was improper. That was wrong. I should have paid it myself. I resigned from the Labor Party front bench and I stepped... Look, any politician who ever tells you they're going to always get it right, that they're not going to make mistakes, that they're perfect, is lying. But the question is, what do you learn from it and what changes from it? And what I've learned from it, and I've grown to this view, and is a result of my own experiences, is donation reform. And secondly, there's a whole personal thing there about myself about right. needing to learn we, to We'll, we'll come back to you. I want to hear from Erica Betts on this, because no-one's hands are clean here, particularly with Chinese donors. Would you agree? Oh, well, uh, I've been on the record for some time that overseas donations should be banned. Uh, I believe that they should only be from domestic sources uh, within Australia. But, uh, Sam, look, how you could accept money in a public position for private accounts just defies any standard whatsoever. And I'm just astounded that you did it. Um, I just find it, uh, you, you know, sure, we all make mistakes, etc. But how would your donors know that you've got a personal debt other than by waving it in front of them and saying, you know, uh, something's got to be paid? I just find yeah. this to well, be. Well, uh, Eric, uh, we've, we've heard your mea culpa on that, Sam, so I won't come back to you on that. But Mr. Wang, a Chinese citizen with serious connections to the Communist Party, <laughs> gave $770,000 to the Liberal Party before the 2013 election. Was that wrong? Yes, uh, I don't support foreign donations and uh, I've made that clearer for some time and uh, I hold to that view. OK, Sam, I'll kind of come back to you here because Mr Wang is the other half of your story, isn't he? Yeah. He, you, he stood next to you at a press conference yeah. in the Commonwealth Government offices in June of 2016, right. speaking exclusively, both of you, standing next to each other, to the Chinese media. Did you tell them that Australia should not meddle in South China Sea dispute. Let's just take a step back what exactly no, I said. Did you tell no, no, them, did no, no, you tell no, no, no. We're, we're going to get this right. <laughs> I held a press conference about the issue of safe schools with the Chinese media. I had Chinese community leader beside me. At the end of that press conference, I was asked a question about a foreign policy matter that I gave the wrong answer to. The exact wording of which I think was reported in a, a Chinese paper at some point. So they got it right. 
I assume you so. You gave the wrong answer, meaning you I, said... I assume you so. You said something I have contradictory so. to... I, I assume so. I can but that's, isn't that obviously the bit the Chinese media would run well, on their be... news bulletins? Australian politicians says, don't meddle in the South China Sea, well, and it happens that the guy standing next to you well, hang on. had just threatened to take well, $400,000 no, 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 no. well, in funding firstly, away from the Labor Party. Firstly, firstly, right? There was a few days as well, Sam, after the Labor Party made its position very clear through Senator Conroy at I... the National Press Club, and he were you, as another frontbencher, trying only to narrow cast to China your disagreement but... with that policy. I uh, took a question at the end of a press conference mm -hmm. that I gave the wrong answer to. I'm not the first frontbencher or backbencher to get a foreign policy question wrong. You've been running late line for a long time. I won't be the last. Right? I took responsibility for that. I resigned from the Labor Party front bench. OK, let, frankly, let me just I ask you this obvious question, because people still way. don't know the answer to this. Yeah. Did Mr Wang ask you to stage that press conference? Unequivocally, no. So what was he doing there? He was there to bring the Chinese media. No. They wouldn't have come no. of their own volition. We bring Chinese community leaders all the time. So one, more, one more question, Sam, and then we'll leave you alone. But um, did Mr <laughs> Wang, subsequent to that press conference, decide or change his mind and give the $400,000 to the Labor Party? I am not aware of him ever having given or not having given or having made a commitment or not that commitment. That's what Four Corners reported, as you know. Frankly, that's a matter for them. You've never looked into it? They asked me that question and I gave them that exact answer in writing. OK, uh, Kim, I uh, want to ask you, um, back to the question asked by, effectively, the questioner, are foreign donors a threat to our sovereignty? I think that this raises a much broader question about those who exercise power being responsible and thoughtful about how they take on that responsibility. And I think in any decision-making process within our parliamentary system, there are basic principles of citizenship here in terms of an equality of citizenship and a belief in the equality of citizenship of those who are voting for their representatives. And if there is some threat to the weight of their voice being heard in our parliament, then we do have to interrogate that. We do have to think how appropriate is it. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that we live in a globalised world where decisions that are going to affect all of us as Australians are influenced by things that are happening outside of Australia. So it's not as if we live isolated from the rest of the world. It's just how appropriate it is for us as individuals to be taking those issues into account in making decisions in what is meant to be the national... OK, Jamila, I mean, obviously there's huge foreign interference mm. in the US election has now led to the Mueller inquiry <laughs> looking very closely at Donald Trump. I mean, do you see the Chinese influence here in a similar way? I feel like the Russia issue in the United States is of a different league entirely. Having said that, I agree with Eric that foreign donations to political parties are hugely problematic and I think we should be reconsidering that aspect of our political donations culture. I don't think Australians are comfortable with the idea that influence can be bought. And I don't think we want to see our system, our political system, move to the kind of system as we see in the States, where you have to be a multimillionaire or a billionaire to become the president. Mm. You know, we, we, I like the so idea... So you'd include that, any big corporate donor, not simply foreign donors? I think that's, donors? that's a conversation we need to have, but I think actually more urgent than that conversation around who can donate is around donations and disclosures. Mm. I think that's got to have come first because that's the most urgent problem with our current process. At the moment, I think it took something like seven or eight months after the last election for who donated to which party to be published publicly. So people, we're not able to take that into account when we're voting, when we're being involved in democracy. We just learn later who donated where and what decisions that might have influenced. We at least need to start with a register that allows that to be published as those donations happen. Um, Eric, you uh, obviously are concerned about foreign donations. Uh, would you join hands across the aisle with, um, with Sam on this issue of trying to stop um, the donations going rampant as they are? Well, I think uh, people should be able to donate to causes within Australia that they believe in, be that the Labor Party and uh, in relation to corporate donations, let's not forget the union donations, which are um, far greater. But that aside, I think if they are within Australia, then uh, in general terms, just as long as they're disclosed and above a certain threshold, then uh, I think that's... So you're only worried about foreign donations? Yes. Multinationals yeah. and no-no then? Yes, yeah. Even if they have branches in Australia? Oh, well, then, 
then you have the question whether it's a division and a company that's registered in Australia, and if it does have a footprint in Australia, then... Uh, they pretty much all do, the multinationals. Well, uh, l let's have a look at that. But the idea of, you know, the George Soroses and others putting in millions of dollars into uh, political campaigns in other countries is just anathema to me and I think to the vast majority of Australians. Michael, does this bother you? Well, well I think uh, what we've heard tonight <coughs> sounds a lot like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Uh, it sounds like uh, this poor man over here has been addicted to uh, donations and now he wants everyone to give him up and uh, more. He's got the zeal of a convert. Uh, but, uh, you know, to be, to be fair, we should see more of this sort of uh, this second chance in Australian public life where we're quite a... That's what Christianity is all about, isn't it, Michael? Indeed, indeed. So I think, I think we're a very unforgiving nation when it comes to people in public life. So let's give this guy a chance to atone and, uh, and make good. Let's see, let's see second chance being, being offered here, uh, especially as he's kind of put his hand up to it. I think the honesty... Uh, you know, saying and taking on the blame, I think, is, uh, is extremely laudable. So, um, so there you go. That's you see, you're my, absolved. You made my mother in the crowd cry. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, we've got a question from a completely different question, Madeleine Nazor. Donald Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville has been criticised by many, including members of his own party, for being insufficient and vague. In a time where the country looks to its elected leader to stand up against intolerance and violence, why did Donald Trump, a man elected to speak blunt truths, stay so quiet? Jamila. I'm holding back my swears. Sorry, <laughs> remembering I'm on television. Um, I am going to uh, leave it to the words of a woman who lost her life in Charlottesville, Heather Heyer, who was out there campaigning against this kind of racism and hate. And she said, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. That was her last public post on Facebook, and that is how I feel right now, and I think that's how a lot of people around the world feel right now. What happened in Charlottesville was disgusting. It was racism, it was white nationalism, it was white supremacism, it was Nazism. And to not call it out for that and instead suggest that there was blame on all sides was utterly unpresidential. Yeah, uh, George W. <laughs> George W. Bush's speechwriter, of all people, has called out the president, said he's abrogated yeah. his moral authority here. Um, that's now that that cry is coming from a lot of Republicans. Um, how? I mean, what could happen? What could Trump do to undo the damage? Uh, I think he sent his daughter out today to tweet. That seems to be usually what he goes for. And then he, he actually wasn't tweeting on the day that, uh, that Charlottesville happened, which for, for Trump not to be tweeting is a big deal. I don't think he can come back from that immediate reaction. I think people will remember that immediate reaction. And there are a large number of Republicans who have come out and named this for what it is. Erica Betts. Look, uh, any form of racism and uh, white supremacy, etc., should be condemned, should be condemned outright. And uh, from what I can gather from the media, that is uh, what the Charlottesville situation was all about and it should have been called out. Well, that's right. I mean, people carrying Nazi flags mm. through mm. the streets, yeah. white supremacists yeah. trying to stop the statue of Robert E. Lee being torn down. Um, but what about the present? Look, uh, Everybody's got their view on Donald Trump and uh, yeah, he is their elected leader and I think a lot of people in the United States will be disappointed that he didn't... Uh, look, condemning all violence is right, but I think in a particular circumstance such as this, it uh, did behove him to uh, call, call out the actual what the cause or the people behind it and condemn it, but, uh, yeah. Michael Jensen. Well, um... What's troubling with the white supremacists is the way, it, for me, is the way in which they adopt Christian symbolism. And one of the interesting things for me to, in that has been the reaction of theologians and church pastors, church leaders in America, including one who said, you know, Christianity was African long before it was European, which is actually true. And of course, it was Jewish long before it was European. And I, I think that really needs to be said in any context in which you see crosses uh, used in that, uh, in that vile, vile way. Uh, it's just, it's a no-brainer. Donald Trump should have said outright that this was objectionable. Uh, racism has no place in, in American society, or, and certainly not in ours. And, uh, you know, he's, he's made, a, made a blue. Sam Dostieri. Look, it's disgusting. It's deplorable. Uh, and just as, just as we have a responsibility to call out things like, you know, 
Islamic extremism for what it is. We need to call out this type of white nationalism for what it is. Uh, this is terrorism by another form. This is terrorism by another name. And it is on the same plane, as far as I'm concerned, as what some of the jihadists get up to. Uh, it is horrible. It is disgusting. It is awful. It should be condemned. And let's not kid ourselves. We sometimes convince ourselves, oh, this is just what happens in America, right? I was around during the Cronulla riots. You know, if you want to have a look at some of these groups like Reclaim Australia, like the United Patriots Front, about the stuff they post on people like myself and Ann Alley's and others kind of uh, web websites and Facebook pages, it is sick, sick, deplorable, awful, horrible stuff. They are extremists. There is no place for them in American society, but there certainly should never be a space for them in our society. Uh, Kim Rubenstein, there's a connection, obviously, in the family uh, with Judaism. I mean, his son-in-law, um, possibly even his grandchildren. Um, what, how can you explain his silence on this? I mean, people walking through before the violence, before the guy revved up his car and drove into the crowd, uh, carrying Nazi flags through Charlottesville. It's really um, so concerning on so many levels, but I think it also comes back to this very fundamental issue about leadership in any democratic society. There will always be fringe elements in a society <coughs> who espouse hatred to other individuals. And so it is incumbent on anyone in power to make it entirely clear that that is just not acceptable in a civilised democratic society. And I think Sam's last point is right, that we have to think about that more closely here too, in terms of the regulation of hate speech. And of course it's a very real issue in Australia in terms of some of the public discussion about Section 18C and the regulation of speech. It comes under that broader framework that what does a civilised society say should be regulated in terms of what we can say as human beings to one another and what we can promote to other human beings. OK, well, we never get through all the questions here on Q&A, so we're launching a new experiment, Q&A in the House. Every week while Parliament is sitting, we'll hold our politicians to account by putting your questions to a senior MP. This Wednesday, ABC political editor Chris Yorman is our guest host. The politician on the spot is the Health Minister, Greg Hutt. Mm. Please send your questions for the Health Minister on Twitter, Facebook or to our website by noon on Wednesday. Can we Five... submit as well? You can't. <laughs> at at 5.30pm uh, Eastern Time, Wednesday afternoon, Q&A in the House will stream on Facebook Live from Parliament House. Like our Facebook page to get the notification. Well, our next question comes from Dan Iacchini. Opponents of same-sex marriage have already come out swinging, drawing parallels to bestiality, killing disabled children and incorrectly claiming negative outcomes of having same-sex parents. My boyfriend and I want the panel tonight to explain how they can guarantee this postal plebiscite won't continue to humiliate us and publicly disparage our relationship in the coming months. Erica Betts, fear that hate may invade this campaign. Look, uh, let's be clear. Sadly, there are elements on both sides of this debate that will stretch the boundaries. The simple fact is the vast majority of Australians can have this debate, will have this debate, and uh, will conduct themselves in a manner that, that is appropriate. And so, uh, you know, some of the things that have happened, for example, to the Australian Christian lobby, I'm sure you would condemn. Um, people, uh, the staff at a hotel being threatened so they couldn't have their function, uh, the bomb blast that went off, the egging of their headquarters, that sort of behaviour is unacceptable. And similarly, on the other side of the equation, there have been uh, people that have uh, uh, engaged in unacceptable behaviour. But just because you recognise that there is um, a quality about the marriage relationship which relates to children, and uh, I make no apology for saying to you that I believe that the best uh, methodology for socialising the next generation is to allow children to grow up with their biological parents having the security of that and having the diversity of a male and female role model. I believe that that is the best 
methodology, and let's have a discussion about that. Eric, I'm going to interrupt you there because our question had his yeah. hand up. Uh, so we'll go back to you. You wanted to, obviously yeah. to respond. Senator Abetz, you say that you can trust the Australian people to have a respectful debate. Those comments about bestiality come from your colleague, Bronwyn Bishop. So if you can't actually maintain this rubbish coming from your own political party, how on earth are you going to met, um, mediate the Australian public? Paul, in a country that uh, allows free speech, in, in a country that allows free speech, uh, people will make these comments, and I think the Australian people will make their own determination about that sort of comment. Uh, it is like the sort of commentary that is directed at myself, um, Facebook and elsewhere, that I'm a homophobe, that I'm a bigot, that I engage in hate speech, because I happen to believe that marriage is not about the adults as much as it is about the socialisation of the next generation. And Bertrand Russell said as much, uh, not a uh, Christian by any stretch of the imagination, I think in 1923 he said that, the High Court in Russell and Russell said that the marriage relationship was only really uh, legislated because of children and bringing up children. So, Eric, I'm going to, just going to interrupt yeah. you there just for a minute, and just because I'm sure a lot of people will be asking themselves, what do you say to the children of same-sex marriages? Because don't they have exactly the same family set up in some ways as anyone else? Look, in some ways they do, but we as a society well, what, ought to what, ask... What is wrong with it, then, if that's the case? What, what we ought to ask is, what is the best situation for children to grow up and... Knowing your biological parents is uh, a great security to many, many, or most children, I would have thought. And having the diversity of a male and female role model in your socialisation, I think, is important. OK, I'm sorry, what... we've, got, we've got another gentleman with his hand up there. He's obviously enthusiastic to jump in. Go ahead. May it please the panel. My name is David Folletta, F-O-L-E-T-T-A, for the record. My comment, and I've also got a question following my comment. I was born without knowing my parents. I was born, my, no one knows who my dad is. My mum, she was a schizophrenic. More than likely, she was raped, and I was, um, I was born as a result of that. I can actually agree with Senator Abetz that growing up without my uh, biological mum and my uh, biological dad, if I had the choice, I'd go for it. And the deficiency in that I would experience if I only had two mums or two dads, um, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And the best example that I can um, give is when a person is employed as labour hire, then they never have any identity of where they're actually employed. And to cause a kid to grow up as 18 years worth of labour hire... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. I, I think I'll just draw you to the end of your comment and sure. we'll have to move on, sorry. OK. Um, so the identity and the security that comes from um, being able to know who your parents are, that is absolutely invaluable. And you also look at the... Um, election, the referendum in Ireland, where they actually said that, uh, relied on a high uh, decision, that the referendum has no impact and the impact on children is irrelevant. And that was a in communicated... Okay, in right, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 we could get you to join us on the panel here, but that's probably not going to work. So we'll just have to take that as a comment. Sam? Um, Dan, I, I wish I could tell you that it's not going to get ugly. I think it is going to get very, very ugly. I think it's going to get horrible. Let's be clear what this debate is about and isn't about. What it's about is whether two people who love each other, regardless of their gender, should be able to be married or not. What it's not about is a debate about children. We have children already. We have children already in whole different series of relationships. And Eric, I'm sorry, but you can't sit here and tell us about that we need to have more reasonable debate and the tone of the debate. When you look at your own history, of comments when it comes to this matter. Your own history of what you've said in these debates, going all the way back to when you were first elected in 1994. I mean, Eric, you argued against, against 
the decriminalisation of homosexuality in Tasmania under the guise of some kind of states' rights matter all the way back in 1994, and you have pursued an objection to LGBTI rights throughout. So the idea, I mean, some of the most hurtful comments that have been said in this debate over 20 years, over 20 years, have come from you of all people, and to sit there and talk about Sam, the tenor of debate. Sam, that is a great smith. Well, Eric, I have it here. I have here. This what is a, your press release from 1994. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it here. Yeah, yeah. OK, I'm sorry. No, no, it's titled, it's titled Federalism Perverted to Allow Sodomy and Incest. That's right. A fig leaf of federalism to argue no, against... No. Well, Eric, I'll put it up on my Facebook page and people can determine for themselves. All right, Sam, let him respond. Uh, go ahead. Look. We're going to be quick, though. Give us a yeah. 20-second response. We're running out of time. The federal parliament was seeking to use its foreign affairs power to override the state government. And that was what I was objecting to uh, very, very strongly. And, uh, Sam, I think you and a few other people know that uh, that sort of slur in relation to me is uh, completely wrong. And uh, you would know that because you shook hands with somebody in the green room uh, just before this evening. And uh, that sort of slur on me does you no justice. Eric, these are your words. This is your All right, words. OK. Yeah. So I'm going to... OK, let's, let's hear from Michael. I, I just want to say there is no place for gay hate speech yeah. in this discussion whatsoever. There's no, no place for that. And uh, those making the no case need to, need to abide by that. I absolutely, just absolutely uh, think that's the case. Uh, but we need to, we need to are, think are better of ourselves. Are you part of the no case? Do you I identify am, yourself I, as a no campaigner? I will, uh, I will be voting no. Um, but will I you think be campaigning so. for no? I will be voting no and I'll be making my, my case uh, plain. Uh, I think that the, the no case is not about how you feel about uh, gay people. It's about whether you think this particular relationship has a special place, the particular relationship, which is not just about uh, love, about whether you love one another, but it's about a lifelong commitment. It recognises uh, the bio biological reality uh, that, uh, of where we come from in human life. And uh, I think that case can be made in a civil way. Yeah. Uh, now, the question I want to ask uh, Sam here is, can you make a case against same-sex marriage and not be a bigot? Yes. Yes, you can. You and, can? and by the way, uh, Michael, you wrote, coming into here, I did a little bit of research and I obviously kind of, there was a piece that I think you may have written for the drum or somewhere else, yeah. uh, I think it's part of your book. Yes, you can make that case. I, I don't believe we should have a postal plebiscite for that case to be made. Uh, I believe people do have different views and people can make those views reasonably. I, I believe the pieces I've seen from you have made that case uh, reasonably. I disagree with that and I feel the parliament gets paid. All right. We have a job to do, okay. let's just do it. So I'm going to hear from the rest of our panellists and uh, go ahead, Kim. I think the real concern here is a failure of leadership in terms of we have a parliament to represent the people and our system of democracy provides for a proper debate within a parliamentary framework for doing so, to revert back to a populist uh, conception of voting for something that is so fundamental to individuals in society is basic in terms of <laughs> rights, protection and civilised discourse that we're really seeing a failure of leadership. So, Kim... <laughs> I said the... Uh... OK, thank you very much. I said the uh, High Court's going to have a busy time. Right. One of the other things they'll have to so... decide on is whether to allow the postal plebiscite to go ahead because there's at least one case uh, run by the Public Interest Advocacy Centre that's yes. actually making the case that the government does not have the power that's right. to do this. So this... Now, what's, what's the argument? How strong will it be? So there are two arguments, really. One is the government is relying on the Australian Bureau of Statistics to collect the information. Is that lawful? Governments just can't choose whatever they want to do. We have a constitution. I've actually got mine here in front of me. <laughs> just fell apart. Uh, it, it, yes, it's the very well The constitution's falling used. apart. <laughs> we have a constitution which says that just because you have power doesn't mean you can do whatever you, you like. One of those things is you have to make laws within the various heads of power. So does this properly fall within that law? But the other more fundamental issue is where does the government have the power to spend the money in terms of if... Um, as a matter of appropriation, does the executive have the capacity to do this? And it is so not is clear. That, is, is that only for a vote? Because this is a survey. So has the government found a clever way around this whole dilemma by calling this a survey and not a vote? After all, it has no 
binding power as a vote, does it? But they're two separate issues. So that is definitely relevant to that issue as to whether this is a statistical assessment of people's views. Mm. But the other is, is the expenditure itself appropriate in terms of the executive's power to appropriate money? So it'll be a sort of a, well, a case run on two arms. It's been appropriated, but in has it been lawfully appropriated? In the event that there was a full postal plebiscite, so that was already appropriated and uh, was there in the budget. Regrettably, uh, the parliament determined that a full post... Uh, that a full... Um, um, Plebiscite. Plebiscite, where people actually have to present to the uh, polling booth, was not to be held, and as a result, the government then determined to go for what it acknowledges as second best. Jim Miller. Um, God. I, I, I think there's so much we need to recognise. Firstly, this is not a vote. It is certainly not a plebiscite. It is a, it is a non-compulsory, non-binding postal survey that is going to be run by the organisation that didn't realise that lots of people were going to log onto the internet to do the census on census night. I feel <laughs> deeply uncomfortable with the fact that this is an issue of an unaffected majority sitting, sitting around debating and discussing an issue of minority rights. And tonight's panel, which is full of straight people, is a microcosm of that. And I think that's problematic. How do you know that? I, yeah, a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Is my understanding. <laughs> and I did chat with people in the green room. And I, I, what, I, what I think this boils down to is just this absolute misconception of those in the No campaign about what these relationships are. Kevin Andrews was on Sky News today comparing gay relationships, who want, people who want to get married, to him and his cycling buddies. Like, I'm sorry? Like, it's just a fundamental misunderstanding and disrespect for what a relationship of love is. And I know you think marriage is this great bastion of wonderfulness for raising children. I'll give you my own example to show you that it's not true. My child, friends, was conceived out of wedlock. <laughs> He's all right. He's two. He's the happiest little kid. OK? He's the happiest little kid. He is now being raised in a happy marriage. That's, that's a happy marriage where if respect. anything happened to my husband and I, he would go to a gay couple Res to be raised and they would do a wonderful, wonderful job because they love that little that's boy. The same way that the <laughs> With respect, it's not about the quality. It's no, one's, no one's judging the quality of parenting. Uh, people have children out of wedlock. That is not news. But you are judging okay. the quality of parenting. No, we're you saying say no. On the, on the contrary, this particular this particular unit of uh, of uh, relationship in society has a particular special purpose, uh, which we I think we can hold as special without saying that other people's relationships are lesser. You can you can say this is just a different quality of thing. But Michael, you are you are saying it's lesser, and the process that we're going through. The thing that I find horrible about this process, you know, when I. When I wanted to marry my wife, Helen, I had to get one person's permission, my wife, and it was pretty hard to get her to agree to that. Uh, <laughs> but now we're saying if you're in a gay relationship like, like Dan is, I'm not sure if you're planning to get married, but hey, we've just announced it now on television. Um, <laughs> congrats. Um, you can propose now. Um, have to go and get the permission of, what, 17 million other people or maybe half that, depending on how many bother well, to that opposed to it. Well, it's not just about minority rights and doesn't affect the rest of us. It's actually an institution that's been part of uh, our society for millennia, for human, human history ever since. And it means that uh, it actually changes the nature of that, which changes then uh, yeah, see, that's, society, that's where the we whole of society. That's where we disagree, thought. Michael. I mean, I, I, respectfully, I'd say that I don't believe that my marriage to my wife is weakened because Dan's going to marry his, you know, partner at a wedding that I'm now inviting myself to. <laughs> can I... Can I uh, we've actually got a questioner in the audience, Ryan Kalimlin. <laughs> Where's Ryan? So in John 8, 7, Jesus says, Let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. Why do you believe that you are better than the LGBTI community and have the capacity to throw the first stone? And further, why do you believe it is necessary to provide these stones to, uh, for others to throw? Michael. I certainly do not feel, I do not think, I know that I'm not better than members of the gay and lesbian community whatsoever. I'm a broken, sinful human being. I'm not superior to anyone. I have, I have absolutely no claim to moral superiority whatsoever. And I repudiate the idea that there is, there is stone throwing. I, I stand utterly, 100% against the bullying of gay and lesbian citizens. Here, here. Yeah. I think it is all very well to say that you're not judging at the same time as, as 
providing your own sense of judgment. In a society where, where there is respect for other human beings, there has to be an acknowledgement that people will do things differently mm. and that society can accept that. There's, the, there's a certain freedom that we have to make decisions about our own lives and that the state should not be able to compel us or to direct that we're not allowed but to do that. this isn't an argument about freedom. This is an argument at an institution that society has created that names a particular type of relationship. You don't have to agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be for, for people not to agree with that logic. But it's not about freedom. That's the sort of European model of marriage where we all have a sort of state register and you go in and, and then you have your church wedding or your non-church wedding separately. But in the Anglo-Saxon world, we don't do it that way. And that's not the debate that the, um, the Yes campaign are running. They want they, they, they're after something much more substantial than just freedom. I think they're after the recognition that comes from that. I'm going to go to another question. It's from Mimi Brunson. It actually deals with the uh, plebiscite itself or the postal vote itself. Go ahead. Um, the Electoral Commission released a statement on Friday in response to the confusion about the eligibility of 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the Marriage Law Postal <coughs> Survey, in which they explained that although this age category may be provisionally enrolled, they are not added to the Commonwealth electoral roll until they turn 18 and so are not given a vote. As a 17-year-old in our society, I want to know why <coughs> this is the case. Given that this is a postal survey, the results are not likely to represent the voice of the younger generation. So why not extend the voting opportunity to those my age who are already provisionally enrolled? Jamila, I'll start with you there. Um... I am the government and I say vote, not vote. So fill out your survey. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the point is it's a survey, so why do the 16, electoral yeah. role provisions apply? And 16 and 17 year olds can get married. I mean, you can, you can get, you know, as long as you have permission from your parents, oh. you can get married at 16 and 17. With court permission as well. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, why not have a say? I think, I think this, you know, it is not an accident that this method of trying to find words that aren't voting. This method of having your opinion heard <laughs> has been manufactured in a way that disenfranchises younger people. So tell, tell, younger us, people... tell us in, in what way, because they don't know how to use the postal it's... service? I, I, I know we, like, we love to like, have a whack at the millennials, no, no, right? I, I no, think, I, look, I, it's a, it's a question. Every time a baby boomer asks me to help them with their phone again, I'm going to be like, no, no, not till you teach me how to post a letter. Um, <laughs> seriously, though, like, you've, got, you've got young people who want to participate in democracy. Young people are less likely to be on the electoral roll. Mm. They're less likely to be checking the mailbox, they're less likely to have a fixed address, they're less likely to be enrolled at the correct address, and they're far more likely, overwhelmingly more likely, to support marriage equality. You know, there are a lot of people who think this plebiscite itself is going to motivate young people to enrol. I hope so. I mean, I mean so, the third of party's backing on it. We've already, we've already <laughs> seen big numbers. I think something like more than 60,000 people have jumped onto the electoral roll, which is mm. a wonderful thing. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I only wish that it was for a reason that was a good one rather than the fact that the next few months, I think, are going to be filled with a lot of bile and a lot of hate. So, Michael, does it worry you at all that, uh, if you take what the questioner is saying, that uh, young people seem to be uh, being discriminated against in some way in this process? Well, they wouldn't it, have been it, discriminated against if the Labor Party and the others had pushed through the plebiscite in the first place. <laughs> and I'm disappointed about that because that would have been a very dis and a decisive uh, and very uh, you know, indisputable outcome. And uh, young people would have... It would, would, we wouldn't have been arguing about whether... So you think this system will be disputable? Oh, I don't doubt that uh, those on the yes side, if the campaign doesn't go their way, will disregard it. I think, I think that's, a, that's a kind of given. And what if it um, goes the other way? Um, if it goes the other way, uh, if it goes to the yes case, I will accept. I'm for, me, for my own, I, I accept that, and I want to. I want to work for the, the community in, in, in Australia too. So let's, let's just get this straight. So, if the vote goes against what you want, uh, mm. then you'll change your opinion. No, no, I'll accept that that's what Australia wants. I'm not yeah. going to campaign yeah. to have it changed again. I think yeah. if that's what happens, that's what happens. So, will you be comfortable if senators like? Erica Betts then switch their vote and say, I'm going to vote how the people of Tasmania told me to vote, which is well, that's marriage up to, equality? That's up to the Senate. Um, Sam Dossier, you, you want to it up? <laughs> oh, I'll be honest. Um, frankly, the whole thing's a joke. Uh, we shouldn't be doing it anyway. Uh, I voted against 
any type of plebiscite. Uh, I don't believe that we need uh, 17 million or however many million Australians making passing judgment on other people's relationships. If we are going to have this postal survey, I would love to see 16, 17 year olds be included and be allowed to, to participate. Frankly, I don't understand why we're not even doing it online or using other methods to get young people to engage. But oh, let's not pussyfoot around this. Regardless of the outcome of this joke of a postal plebiscite, I will continue to support marriage equality and I will continue to vote for marriage equality any opportunity I have in the parliament. With respect, I think opinion. it's really bad to call it a joke because I, I, must, I want this, if this is the process that's going to happen, let's get behind oh, it. Look, I, want, I want young people to vote in the, in the process. I am going so to work on the Yes campaign. Right? I'm going to do what I can again. Because, right... So, I, why, so people won't vote because they'll think, oh, no, it's a joke. No, 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 no. What we're saying to people is this. We do not want this. We should not have to have this. This is a ridiculous system the government's put us in, but if it's the system we're in, we're going to win because we're going to work and we're going to fight and we're going to stand up for what we believe in. Uh, Kim, uh, uh, how academic is this? Will the High Court decide to <laughs> drop the whole thing, do you think? Well, um, I'm not on the court at the moment, so let's say Which, that uh, what it needs to do is assess... You're saying at the moment. At <laughs> <laughs> the very moment. Um, After tonight's performance, I think we're about to put her on. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're going for a drink afterwards. I, I, I think that there are really um, serious questions about an, an abuse of power, of using a postal vote as a frame for dealing with other internal political issues. It's as simple as that. And I think that the... <laughs> but the High Court is going to look at the precedents in relation to appropriation and the proper extent of executive power in this circumstance, because there is no... There was no um, legislation to support a plebiscite. But, Tony, the reality is we went to the election saying that if we were re-elected, there would be a plebiscite. And it's interesting that the opinion polls that everybody refers to saying how Australians are in favour of same-sex marriage are the same opinion polls that are telling us that the Australian people want to say they want a plebiscite. They, those same opinion polls are telling us that. And so I've got to ask Sam and others on this panel, what have you got to fear by asking the Australian people to cast a judgement on this foundational institution of our society, an institution that pre-existed... OK, Christianity Eric, we're nearly out of time. Um, can, can we agree that this is not a plebiscite? So the thing that you promised is not happening. This is not a plebiscite. It's a survey. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we're, and, we're, and we for are those put... that are clapping, just remind yourselves there was Labor and the Greens yep. that stopped this in the Parliament. We should have just voted. Well, just have a free vote, Eric. Okay, sorry, just have a free vote. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give the last word to uh, Mimi up there. She's 17 years old. She wants a vote. If you had the chance, what would you vote? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's all we have time for tonight. Obviously, we'll come back to this debate again and again and again <laughs> and again. Please thank our panel, Michael Jensen, Sam Dastiari, Kim Rubenstein, Jamila Rizvi and Erica Betts. <laughs> now, remember, you can continue discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and GetUp's Sally Rugg. They're taking comments on ABC News Radio right now and Facebook Live. Well, just as soon as we finish anyway. And join us for Q&A in the House when the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, answers your questions live from Parliament House on Facebook Wednesday afternoon, 5.30 Eastern Time. Now, next week on Q&A, the Leader of the Opposition, Bill Shorten. According to the Prime Minister, he's the most dangerous and left-wing Labor leader in generations. But according to the polls, Bill Shorten is on track to win the next election. And in case you're wondering, we're asking, and we have been speaking to the Prime Minister. We continue to do so. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull about joining Q&A soon, leather jacket or not. Uh, next Monday, join Q&A with Bill Shorten. Until then, good night.